afternoon, everyone. Quick show of hands. Who here works for a financial services company? A bank, payments processor, credit card company? Raise your hands. All right. So keep your hands up. If, so keep, raise your hands if you work for a technology company now. Technology company. So in this group, who works for a financial services company that now calls itself a tech company? We really need to think about that last question because we're living in an extraordinary time of change. Companies across all industries are transforming themselves into technology companies, some with more success than others. So how can you be successful in navigating this change? And how can you create a culture of innovation in your own companies? In the next 15 minutes, I will try to help you answer some of those questions. All right, here we are in 2018, and we're talking about the disruption of financial services by technology. Imagine it's 1867, and you work for a brokerage firm in New York City. One of the items in your expenses is a cadre of messenger boys in suspenders and caps, and their job is to run back and forth between your office and New York, ex New York Stock Exchange delivering stock price movements. That same year, a guy named Edward Callahan, he works for a technology company at the time, Western Union. He realizes that he could instead use a telegraph to send the prices directly to each of the brokers ha brokerage houses in a continuous stream, much more quickly and efficiently, he invented the stock ticker machine. Edward Callahan was the world's first fintech disruptor. <laughs> Fast forward 100 years, a, another fintech disruptor. In 1967, Barclays became the first bank to install an ATM machine in Enfield in North London. In 1984, another fintech disruptor, Michael Aldrich, he built the first online shopping system. A 72-year-old grandmother executed the very first transaction. She bought margarine and eggs and cornflakes. In 2009, another fintech disruptor, Satoshi Nakamoto, mined the very first block of Bitcoin. Today, Almost 150 years after that very first stock ticker, Google created a quantum computer. While we're still in the very early days of quantum computing, it's no longer just a theoretical concept. The pace of technology disruption is increasing exponentially, and it cannot be ignored. Technology is everywhere. The intersection of various technologies, things like cloud and mobile, and social and IoT and big data and artificial intelligence are having a profound impact on our lives and on business. With cloud, we now have friction-free access to technology to anyone. Barriers to entry to marketplaces are disappearing. With things like mobile and social, businesses have amazing reach where they can reach anyone on the planet, and not just people. Devices as well with IoT. And all these interactions and connections create data that can be processed with big data and machine learning and turned into knowledge and insights and engagement that has never been possible before. And that has done something profound. Innovation has been democratized. A 20-year-old is sitting at a cafe in the annex, and she has an idea for a business. She logs into her Google Cloud account. She spins up a few servers. She buys market data from data providers. She hires a data scientist to write the machine learning models. But when the computations get too heavy, she logs back into her Google Cloud account and adds some TPUs, tensor processing units, Google specialized processors for machine learning. 
she connects to her favorite financial services provider through their published APIs for any payments and, and clearing services. And there you go. She has her FinTech up and running. And she hasn't even finished her cappuccino. This isn't that far away from the stories of how some of the most successful FinTechs got started. Like Ripple and Venmo and Square and TransferWise. What you should be worried about is who's next. Because it's no longer about the big versus the small. It is now about fast versus the slow. Change is going to come. Are you going to be an agent of it? Or are you going to be a casualty? That question can only be answered if we're willing to reimagine what financial services can be. Imagine if all transactions were done through a distributed ledger and all trading and payments and settlements were done in real time. Imagine if all the risks were being calculated with machine learning models in real time, taking into account news updates and weather patterns and human behavior and sensor data. Imagine regulations being expressed in machine learning models. So all audits could be done in real time, embedded into our systems. All this could lead to much more transparent and liquid and cheaper and safer marketplaces which in turn could introduce 2 billion new customers to your products and services, customers who are not even part of financial markets today. Some of you may remember this quote. He said it in 1994, and it is now more true today than it has ever been before. Because it's no longer about making money through fees and holding on to capital for trust. It is now about a world where cost of transactions are approaching zero, and trust is established through intimacy and transparency, not just capital. For too long, we've been focusing on doing things better bit by bit. Now it's time to do different things. So what are the technology investments that you should be making today to face the future with confidence? First. Get to the cloud. Run to the cloud. Any triathletes in the room? Bike to the cloud. Swim to the cloud. Uh, before coming to Google, I, uh, I built trading and risk management systems for some of the world's largest financial services institutions. The mission was simple, to build financial software that enables efficient and safe and sound financial markets. Now, unfortunately, doing that involves spending an inordinate amount of time on things like hardware procurement and supply chain management and capacity planning and database maintenance and software upgrades. Sound familiar? Cloud allows you to change that. It allows you to focus on technology that differentiates and defocus technology that does not. And it allows you to do that in a more secure and more compliant way than you're able to achieve that on your on-prem setup today. And it's not just about freeing up resources. It's about having a technology platform that enables faster product de development, agile innovation, and better control over your resources. At Google, we've been building and operating a hyperscale cloud for a very long time. Over the years, we've built seven platforms with over one billion users each. Things like Gmail and Android and Chrome and Maps and YouTube. Raise your hand if you have used any of these products. Raise your hand. All right. Keep your hand up if you've used any of these products today. All right. Keep your hand up if you've used them since I started talking. It's OK. <laughs> Whether you're listening to me or using our products, it's all Google. <laughs> now, along the way, we learned quite a bit about the cloud. We learned about scale and security and reliability and efficiency. And it is that same platform, infrastructure, and expertise that we now make available to our Google Cloud customers.
to run their own businesses at scale with reliability and security and performance. And now today, our Google Cloud customers serve their one billion users on that same infrastructure. Once you get to the cloud, you can finally turn data into insights. Financial services has always been a data-heavy business. And over the last few years, there's this been an explosion of data. Things like news feeds and product reviews and search trends and commercial transaction data, credit card data, satellite imagery, foot and car traffic, shift locations, you name it. Where is all that data going to go? Today, it's going to proprietary databases that are not integrated, and you don't get value from that data outside of that particular application. It is estimated that the businesses today only make 0.5% of available data. That data can enable you to do enormous number of interesting things. Online prices of millions of items can be used to assess inflation. The number of customers visiting a store and transacting can give real-time sales estimates. All this data can help you improve customer insights and payments experience and risk management. However, marshalling all that data and putting it into the right format is not an insignificant challenge. That's why at Google, we have built a unique serverless data platform that lets you spend more time understanding your data and less time with the setup and tuning of your databases. So what's next for data analytics? We think the answer is machine learning. At Google, machine learning is already enabling us to rethink just about everything. Machine learning is embedded into many of our products already, and it's helping us make all of our products better over time. We also applied machine learning to our data centers. Now, data centers are core to our business. And they make up a healthy portion of our operating costs and our environmental footprint. Now, the equipment and how we operate that equipment and environmental factors interact with each other in very nonlinear ways. So the traditional approaches of formula-based engineering or human intuition often doesn't capture these interactions, kind of like the financial markets. Our DeepMind um, researchers designed a neural network to look at things like sensor data from the server racks and chillers and cooling towers and temperatures and pump speeds and fans and windows. And by doing that, we were able to reduce our cooling costs by 40%. What if you could reduce your transaction costs by 40%? What if you could reduce your false positives of your fraud detection systems by 40%? What if your client onboarding was 40% faster and your customer churn was reduced by 40%? Today, right now, we have customers running machine learning models on Google Cloud to do fraud prevention and anti-money laundering and risk systems. Our clients are improving customer experience through chatbots and multi-channel insights. They're optimizing their back office processes by using NLP, natural language processing, to process documents for client onboarding and loan processing and KYC. They're building personalized financial products by analyzing vast amounts of structured and unstructured data looking for trends. At Google, we have machine learning embedded in everything that we do. And we're helping our clients do the same. This is one of my favorite quotes. Now, earlier in the talk, I said it's no longer about doing things a little better. It's about doing different things. Now, Henry Ford did exactly that. Instead of faster horses, he gave us the Model T. And today, this quote comes up a lot when we talk about innovation. What we hear about a lot less is, what happened next? After dominating the auto market from 1908 all through 1910s, in 1920s, Ford experienced a catastrophic loss of market share from which it never recovered. So what happened? 
Henry Ford's genius was adapting the assembly line for car manufacturing. He reduced the time it took to build a car from 12 hours to 2 hours and 30 minutes. He continued to focus relentlessly on efficiency and productivity and cost reduction at the expense of freezing Model T's design. Then, a disruptor came along in the 1920s, General Motors. And they started offering installment selling, used car trade-ins, and annual model changes. People didn't want faster horses anymore. They wanted better cars with better financing options. Now, the real lesson here is not that Ford failed to listen to his customers, but that he failed to continually test his vision against reality. He failed to create a culture of continuous innovation. So how do you do that? Fostering innovation is not just about innovation centers and hackathons and innovation jams and startup boot camps. And it's not about how much you spend on technology. It is about having the right technology infrastructure and a culture that embraces innovation at all levels of the organization. Do you have people that understand tech and innovation at the board level? Do you have tech people as part of your C-suite? Do, does your tech experts sit together with your business experts? Are you able to tackle legacy systems as well as building new technology? And finally, do you have a technology partner that can help you create an environment that promotes innovation? At Google, innovation doesn't stop with technology. We've focused on reinventing the relationship between the cloud provider and the cloud customer. And that relationship starts with openness. And that's more than just open source. It's about flexible architectures and open and honest engineering discussions. It's about putting you in control of your own destiny. It's about taking that makes everything, that makes Google great and sharing that with you. And to co-invest in the future of your business with you. So are you ready? to transform your financial services company into a technology company. If not, keep your eyes open for that 20-year-old that's sitting at a cafe in the annex. Thank you.